everybody. This set of notes is going to be about atomic structure. We're going to look at some models of the atom throughout time, and then we're going to learn about how to count the various particles that are inside an atom. We're going to start with Dalton's atomic theory. He was not the first person to have an atomic theory, but he was one of the first ones to have a model that closely resembles some of the things we know to be true about atoms even today. So we are just going to jump straight ahead to Dalton's atomic theory. We're going to break it into six parts. I've seen people break his theory into three parts, all the way up to eight parts. It doesn't really matter as long as you're including all the important pieces of information. I like to break it into six different parts. So part one, Dalton thought that all matter was composed of extremely small particles called atoms. And we know that to be true even today. That everything we see is built from different combinations of different atoms being put together. So Dalton's first part of his theory was true. The next part is that Dalton thought atoms of a given element are identical in size, mass, and other properties. He thought every atom of carbon was identical to every other atom of carbon. He thought every atom of hydrogen was identical to every other atom of hydrogen. We now know that to be false. In a little while, we'll see why that's not true, but for now, we can just put a mark in your notebook that says that this piece of his theory was not true. The third part, atoms of different elements differ in size, mass, and other properties. He thought carbon was different than hydrogen. Hydrogen was different than iron. Iron is different than carbon. And we know that's true. That's why they have different names. They have different masses, they have different properties, they are different. The next part of his theory was that Dalton believed atoms could not be divided into smaller pieces, created, or destroyed. We now know that that is false. It may not be easy to do those things, but it is technically possible. Next, Dalton believed that atoms could combine in different ratios to form molecules and compounds. And we know that that is true. One key piece here is that he, he realized it needed to be whole number ratios. You can have one atom of oxygen and two atoms of hydrogen and put those together, but you're not going to have one and a half oxygen. You're not going to have half of an atom. You're not going to have a quarter of an atom. So we needed to keep them as whole number ratios, and that is true. The last piece is that in a chemical reaction, we're going to combine different atoms together move them around, rearrange them, pull them apart, do all sorts of things to take them apart and put them back together to form new molecules. And that is true. If we were going to try to draw a picture of what Dalton thought the atom looked like, we would just draw a solid sphere. This is often called the billiard ball model. Billiards is another name for pool, so it's like a pool ball just a solid single object. It's a little bit too simple, right? So let's kind of look at what was wrong with his theory a little more closely. We now know that atoms have average masses because of something called isotopes, which we'll look at in a minute. Dalton thought every atom of carbon was the same as every other atom of carbon. And we now know that that's not true. There's slightly different versions. You know, every element has slightly different versions, and we'll learn about that when we learn about isotopes. The next thing was that 
It's true that you cannot divide up an atom into smaller pieces under normal reactions, but you can do that during nuclear reactions. We can smash atoms to pieces. We can make new atoms that didn't exist before. So this was way oversimplified in his theory, which is understandable because it was the 1800s, right? We now know that there's more particles inside an atom and that you can, in theory, smash them apart. So one of the things that really made people realize that Dalton's theory was wrong was when we discovered the electron. So J.J. Thompson discovered that the atom had a separate particle inside of it that was negatively charged. And as soon as we found this negatively charged particle, we realized that there are smaller things than an atom. So Dalton was not correct. J.J. Thompson used what's called a cathode ray tube. So this is a tube that's vacuumed out. They put a gas in here. You pass electricity through it and you're gonna see a beam of electrons come out. And if you put a magnet on one side, you're going to see that the beam of electrons will be attracted to the positive magnet. And so that told them that this beam of particles must be negatively charged. So thinking about what he discovered, you know, if these cathode rays have these electrons in them, then that means that we, you know, everything has these little electrons. No matter what he put in there, he was discovering that they all had the same particle. We also knew at this point that atoms were neutral. Therefore, if he discovered a negative particle, we must have a positive particle somewhere to balance it out, to cancel out the charge. Otherwise, we couldn't have neutral atoms. So that told them, well, now we know there's an electron and we better start looking for something that's positive too. Something else must be there. Another interesting thing they realized is that electrons are super, super, super tiny. If you think an atom's tiny, an electron is even smaller, okay? So that meant that most of the atom must contain heavier particles, comparatively. I mean, you know, an atom doesn't weigh a lot, but compared to the electron itself, there must be something heavier present. If we wanted to look at Thompson's model, it would look a little different. Sometimes this is called the plum pudding model. We don't really eat plum pudding here. So in this country, sometimes you'll hear people call it the chocolate chip cookie model. In the chocolate chip cookie model, the electrons are the chocolate chips, and they're held together by the cookie dough. And they didn't know what that was yet. So they thought some kind of dough was holding together everything, and it must be positively charged. So it's like chocolate chips mixed together with the cookie dough. Well, that was a great model at the time, but then came Rutherford. And Rutherford figured out that this is not how things are arranged. Rutherford used something called the gold foil experiment. This is probably one of the most famous most important experiments that there is. It is one of the few that we do need to know by name and we need to know who did it just because it's that famous. It's that well known. It radically changed our perception of the atom and it really sent people in a certain direction trying to learn more about the model of the atom. So what Rutherford did was he took a piece of gold foil, very, 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 very thin. Imagine like the thinnest piece of tissue paper you could have ever imagined. And he takes a radioactive sample and he sends a beam of particles straight through. And what he saw was that most of the particles bounced 
right through that gold foil, straight through, just ripped right through it. But some of them hit the foil and bounced off in a crazy direction. And that was very unexpected. Imagine if you were running full steam ahead at a piece of tissue paper that somebody was holding up. You should go straight through the tissue paper, right? It would be incredibly surprising if you hit that tissue paper and bounced off of it. You know, if you ran at a brick wall, you would assume you're going to bounce off the wall. You run at a piece of tissue paper, you aren't expecting that you're going to bounce off the tissue paper. So when they saw that, they were pretty surprised. And that really told them that something strange was going on, that they were not understanding what an atom looked like. And so what that started to tell them was that there was something inside these atoms that was very small, but very dense. Dense enough for these helium nuclei, these alpha particles, to hit and bounce off. So if the Thomson model was correct, everything should have just gone straight through. Nothing would have been there to deflect these particles. What the Rutherford model showed was that this super dense core that we now call the nucleus was right in the middle and every once in a while an alpha particle would hit it and bounce off. Most of the particles would go straight through. Some of them would just kind of graze the edge and bounce off a little bit. And then once in a while some would hit and bounce in a wacky direction. Very surprising. So most of the particles went right through. A few of them were really deflected. Some were deflected a whole bunch. What that told them was that the nucleus is very small. The reason they knew it had to be small is that there were not very many that were deflected. Most of them went straight through. If the nucleus was big, most of them would bounce off. So because only a couple bounced off, that meant the nucleus must be pretty small. Alpha particles are fairly heavy particles. They go very fast. They have a lot of power behind them. And so for them to bounce off of something meant that that nucleus must have been very dense. They also realized that this must be the positively charged piece of the atom. They knew the electrons were there, so this was the positively charged part. It also explained why some of them were deflected a little bit because they had a little bit of repelling happening, right? And one of the big takeaways from this is that the atom is mostly empty space. Most of the atom is empty. There is no chocolate chip cookie dough holding it together. They have the nucleus in the center and it's very, very small. Most of it's empty and you have some electrons around the outside. So then that made them wonder, okay, well, where are the electrons? The electrons are on the outside. Where exactly are they? And then came Bohr. The Bohr model is what most um, middle schools teach. They teach you about Bohr models. You draw your nucleus in the center and you draw a bunch of circles going around it. It looks like planets going around the sun. They have to orbit and stay on those rings. The rings kind of look like, you know, if you cut a tree down, you'd see the circle rings inside the tree chunk. The reason they thought it needed to be on rings was because Bohr was trying to explain some of the behavior of the electrons. They were having a hard time explaining why the electron was not being sucked into the nucleus. If the nucleus is positive and the electron is negative, why are they not attracted to each other? So he kind of just said, well, because they're not allowed to. The, the electrons have to stay on their rings. And they knew that wasn't really a good explanation, but it was a good enough model that it allowed them to keep moving forward with their science 
And then as they came up with new discoveries, they could go back and revise their model again. So they kind of knew it wasn't a perfect model, but it explained enough that it let them keep moving forward. Nowadays, we think that the quantum model is the most up-to-date model. And maybe in 10 years, we're gonna find out that it's something different and I'm gonna have to change this PowerPoint, right? Maybe I'll have something new after this. But for right now, this is the newest model that we'll go over. And the idea here is that the nucleus is still in the center, the electrons are still on the outside, but the electrons are not in perfect little circles like planets around a sun. Instead, imagine the electrons buzzing around the nucleus like bees buzzing around a beehive. And the electrons are traveling randomly, but they have a tendency to hang out in certain areas. It's not that an electron can't be way over here, it's just that we don't see it there very often. And so we start to draw these little shapes of everywhere we see the electron buzzing around like a bee around a beehive. And we call these areas that the electrons hang out in their orbit, orbitals. So in the Bohr model, we have orbits, like the orbits of a planet. In the quantum model, we have orbitals. So I wish they had picked words that were a little bit more different. They didn't. So just be a little bit careful about those two words. All right. So at this point, we have electrons, which are negatively charged. They're so tiny that to make our life easy, we say they have a mass of zero. Protons are positively charged. And to make our life easy, we're gonna kind of arbitrarily assign them a mass of one. This is not one gram. This is not one kilogram. It's not one pound. It's not one ounce. It's what we call an atomic mass unit. So it's a kind of arbitrary unit that we made just to make our calculations easy on us. So we just say that a proton weighs one. And a neutron has no charge, it's neutral. And we say that it has a mass of one as well. Now, in real life, the proton and neutron are not quite exactly the same mass, but they're so close that we're just gonna call them both one. So let's kind of look at counting these particles, okay? We know that we have protons, neutrons, and electrons. But how many of each one? Well, if we look at our periodic table, we see little boxes like this. The number at the top is the atomic number. The atomic number is the same as the number of protons. Now, assuming that things are neutral, assuming that things are normal, the number of electrons will be the same as the number of protons. This number down here on the bottom is the mass number. And for now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna round this to the nearest whole number. So 6.94 would round to seven. That's gonna tell us the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So if I ever wanted to find the neutrons, I would just subtract these two numbers, okay? We'll talk about why this is um, not a whole number in a little bit. This is an average, and we'll talk about why it's an average. So the nice thing about atomic numbers is if you have a chart like this to fill out, the number of protons and the atomic number are just the same. You know, carbon is 6, phosphorus is 15, gold is 79. The number of protons is what decides the name. It tells us which element it is. So the protons and the atomic number will always match. Sometimes we call the atomic number just a capital Z. So if you ever see a Z 
it, it's standing for the atomic number. So if we were to change the number of protons, we would make a brand new element with a brand new name, okay? So sodium has 11 protons. If I could somehow take one away, it would not be sodium anymore. I would have to change the name. It would now be neon. So sometimes a question you'll see will be like this. It will ask you, which determines the identity of an atom? And what that really means is, how do we decide which thing is carbon and which thing is oxygen? How do we know which one is hydrogen and which one is iron? And it's based on the number of protons. So the protons determine the name or the identity of an atom. If you change the protons, you gotta change the name. Let's do a little bit of a practice using the mass number. You'll need a periodic table for this. There's one linked on the resources tab of the class website. There should be one in the in the reference sheet section of your three ring binder. So pull up a periodic table so we can do this practice. Remember that the mass number is protons plus neutrons. And remember that we're going to have to round our mass numbers to whole numbers for this. So let's start with oxygen. Find oxygen on your periodic table. If you look at the top of the box, you're going to see that the atomic number is 8, which means I have 8 protons. For now, we're assuming everything is neutral, so we end up with 8 electrons. Now, I told you how many neutrons it had. This atom of oxygen has 10 neutrons. So to get the mass number, I'm going to add these two things up. 8 plus 10 is 18. Now at this point, everybody starts freaking out at me because when they look at their periodic table, they don't see an 18. They see a 16. I know. This oxygen atom is a different version of oxygen. This is oxygen 18. This one on your periodic table is the most common version of oxygen, oxygen 16, but that's not the only version that exists. Sometimes we can have different number of neutrons, and when the number of neutrons is different, we call that an isotope. So this is just a different isotope. It's like saying we all have cell phones, but we all have different versions of cell phones. Some are bigger than others, right? Now, looking at this one, I can tell that this is arsenic because I found the number of protons on the periodic table. And if you look at the box with 33 protons, you're going to find out that it's called arsenic. Now, since we're assuming everything is neutral, if I have 33 protons, that means 33 electrons. Now, to get the mass number, I'm going to add protons and neutrons. So 33 plus 42 tells me 75. Now, I want to be specific over here. I don't want to just say arsenic. I want to use what's called hyphen notation, where I tell you the name, I put a little hyphen or a dash, and then I put the mass number at the end. So this is arsenic 75, okay? When you look at your periodic table and you find arsenic, you're going to see that the mass number is 74.92. So that's telling you that if you averaged all the different masses of arsenic out there, all the different versions together, if you averaged them, you would get an average mass of 74.92.
Well, this particular atom of arsenic is arsenic 75. Okay. The next one, let's see here. Well, 15 protons. I'm going to find 15 on my periodic table. And I find out that that is... Oops, I got my animation backwards. Okay, we'll just roll with it. Okay, the mass number was 31 over here. So let's put the mass number 31 in the box where it belongs. Okay. Now we'll say there's 15 protons. So it must be phosphorus. If I want to find the electrons and it's neutral, I'm going to say 15 protons, 15 electrons. Now to find the neutrons, I'm going to take the total mass, subtract out any protons, and I'll be left with however many neutrons I have which is 16. So let's look a little bit more at this concept of isotopes, right? Like oxygen 16 versus oxygen 18, for example. So atoms of the same element, same number of protons, with different number of neutrons will end up with different masses. And those different versions are called isotopes. So here's just an example for hydrogen. We have several different versions of hydrogen. We have hydrogen one, one proton, one electron, and no neutrons. It's just one little proton, and then on the outside there's an electron. That's the normal type of hydrogen. Sometimes hydrogen might have a neutron, in which case it's going to weigh two, one proton and one neutron. So we have a proton and a neutron. It's called deuterium. It has a special name because there is some fancy equipment called an NMR machine that can't see deuterium. And so what you can do is you can build a molecule with some normal hydrogens and some deuteriums, and it'll make the deuterium kind of invisible in the machine so that you can kind of figure out the structure of the molecule a little bit better. Um, so sometimes these isotopes are very useful, and then they'll have special names. I don't expect you to know the special names, okay? Hydrogen 3 has one proton and two neutrons, so it has a mass of 3. It's a little bit radioactive, it's not super stable, the nucleus is too big, and so it's a little bit radioactive. Kind of an interesting fact. Now, we know these are all hydrogens because they all have one proton. If they didn't have one proton, they wouldn't be hydrogen. I'm allowed to change the electrons or the neutrons, but I can't change the protons without changing the name, okay? So I like the chart because it really shows you that an isotope has the same protons, but different neutrons, okay? One thing that's a little bit tricky is that this average mass you see on the periodic table with the decimal numbers is not like a straight average. You don't just add the masses and divide by how many you have. It's what's called a weighted average. And a weighted average is going to take into account the percentages of what we call abundance. So most of the carbon in the universe is carbon 12. A tiny bit is carbon 13. And a really tiny bit is carbon 14. The heavier it gets, the more radioactive it gets, the more unstable it gets. So that's typically why you're going to see, you know, less of the heavy version. There are obviously exceptions to that, but that's kind of a general thing you can see. If I take into, a, into account the fact that most of the carbon is carbon-12, my average should be closer to 12, okay? 
So when I do a little bit fancier math here and get what's called a weighted average, we will get 12.011. So you can tell that carbon is the most common, or sorry, carbon 12 is the most car common isotope because the average mass is closest to 12. So whichever one you round to is the one that's going to be the most common isotope. Kind of a nice little trick. We will learn how to find this average mass in a later lesson. All right, let's look at what happens when we've changed the electrons. We've already looked at what happens when we change the protons. We get a new name, new element. We've seen what happens when we change the neutrons. We get a new isotope, a new mass. Now let's see what happens when we change the electrons. When we change the electrons, we're going to make what's called an ion. We are going to change the charge on it. So let's have a little chart that looks at our options. We have two options. We can make what's called a cation or an anion. So listen to how I pronounce these. This is a cation and an anion. It's not a cation and it's not an anion. Okay, so cation, anion. A cation has lost electrons, so we have too many protons compared to the electrons. We now don't have enough electrons to balance the charge. That results in a positively charged atom. When we want to show people it's an ion, we use a little superscript, and you put the charge up at the top. So calcium here has lost two electrons. We now have an, like an unequal number of protons and electrons. I have too many protons. An anion gains electrons. So now it's negatively charged atom, right? Like nitrogen here gained three. Because the electron is negative and I have extra electrons, I'm going to end up with extra negative charge. People really struggle with the idea that if you lose something, your answer looks positive. And if you gain something, your answer looks negative. It feels backwards. But that's because you're losing a negatively charged object or you're gaining a negatively charged object. So we're going to kind of go through a couple examples to help you see this a little bit better. Because I think this is one of the things that people struggle with, is these ions. So normally, sodium would have 11 protons and 11 electrons. So we have a plus 11 and a minus 11 charge. Those cancel out, balance each other, and we end up with a neutral atom. No charge. But if I'm going to take away an electron, I still have 11 protons because it's still sodium, but now I only have 10 electrons. So now you can see I end up with a positively charged ion when I'm finished. I didn't have enough electrons to balance out all the protons. Compare that to oxygen. So oxygen normally has eight protons, and eight electrons. So they balance out, we get a nice neutral atom, but oxygen likes to get two extra electrons. Oxygen loves to go steal electrons from other things. So if this oxygen gets two extra electrons, instead of eight, it now has 10. Now it has 10 negatively charged objects but it only has eight positively charged objects. So our overall charge ends up minus two. So the next slide, I'm gonna show you the same concept, but I'm gonna show you with little circles to be like little particle diagrams, okay? 
So if I have three protons and three electrons, I have no charge. Now let's take away an electron. I still have three protons, but now I only have two electrons. So now you can see these cancel out and I'm left with a plus one charge. Let's, over here, let's start back at the beginning, but this time let's add an extra electron. I still have my three protons, but now I have four electrons. I added one more electron, and now you can see once these cancel out, I have too much negative charge. I have a minus one charge. So look at this last example. I have three protons and five electrons. I gained two electrons. Now I have a negative two charge. In the beginning, if you're struggling with the ions, I highly suggest you either draw little circles like these or you go backwards do the math like this, you know, plus however many protons you have, a minus for how many electrons you have, and see what the overall charge counts out to be. So, you know, eventually you'll be able to do that in your head, but if you're having a hard time visualizing it, then do whatever you have to. Draw the circles, do it like a math problem, do what it takes to get the right answer, okay? All right, so just to summarize our examples, oxygen gained some electrons to make a negative two, and it makes it an anion. A cation is when we take away electrons, it ends up positive like our sodium did. We will learn how to determine what charges things like to make. There are some patterns on the periodic table that we'll learn about. For right now, I would tell you what charge to do, or I would tell you how many electrons to add or subtract, so you would be given more information, okay? If you would like, there are some extra videos that I added that go over isotopes and go over ions. So I think sometimes it's helpful if you need to, to watch one of these. Um, so if you need some extra practice, extra explanation on your own time, go ahead and watch these videos. Okay. All right, everybody. I hope that was helpful. Bye.